Now, Luke. Um, thank you for all being so patient while we uh, wait for the time allotted for the uh, people catching in on the stream. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce Mike. He's going to talk to us today about um, computational symbiosis. Um, so please, uh, a quick round of applause for Mike, and um, he'll take it away. Hello, everyone. Um, <clears throat> my name is Mike Gerwitz. I'm a free software hacker and activist with a focus on user privacy and security. I'm a GNU maintainer and volunteer, and I've been programming for about 20 years, half of that professionally, and I've been a computer user for a little longer. So I've had a chance to notice certain trends in how we interact with our machines over the years. And what we've trended toward are attempts to cater to as many users as possible by providing these carefully choreographed workflows that think for you. And I don't doubt or argue that this has been successful in bringing, um, in making computing access accessible to huge numbers of people. Uh, but it's important that we recognize the limitations of this. This is a talk about practical freedoms, which is an issue separate from but requiring software freedom. <laughs> If developers are doing the thinking for us, then even if the software is free, users are still stuck asking developers to implement those changes for them. So what I want to do is to try to blur the lines a little bit between user and programmer and show how users can be empowered to do their own type of computing in practical and powerful ways. So it's going to require a slightly different way of thinking for most users, but I want to start with an example that most people are probably familiar with. So. This is uh, GNU IceCat, which is a Firefox derivative. It's the only GUI, really, I use on a day-to-day -day basis. This is an admittedly staged session with a number of add-ons. It, it doesn't normally look like this. But a common operation to do on the web is to find text. So how you do this exactly varies between browser and browser, but usually it involves clicking on that little hot dog, hamburger, whatever you want to call it menu up there. Click on Find in this page. It opens a bar. You start typing. There's a button to highlight uh, all the text. It shows the number of matches. So this feels like a you know, fairly efficient way to convey your intent to the machine. It seems like a useful feature. But notice how I had to convey these instructions to you. Because GUIs are inherently visual, I had to take screenshots and highlight the portions of the page to actually click on. Another issue is that GUIs change over time. So I'm sure there are people here that remember when it used to be in an edit menu, which you can still get at if you hit Alt, by the way. And um, that I kind of preferred because it provided a more canonical representation for instructions. Saying edit find is pretty clear. But you'll notice in the menu that there is one thing that hasn't changed over the years, and that's this key binding, control F. When you hit control F, it's as if you click the menu option. It immediately appears and you can start typing. And I apologize for my sniffling. I'm coming off of a cold. So normally when we interact with GUIs, it's you know, with a mouse. But the position of our hand on the mouse pad or our fingers on the touchpad don't really have any inherent meaning because the cursor could be anywhere on the screen at any given point in time. But when we switch to using control F, we're switching our mode of interaction from visual to tactile. Suddenly, the placement of our hand on, our key on the keyboard, the motion, the feeling of the key press beneath our fingers, we associate that with the act of finding something. So I want to propose a little simple research task. Let's say I emailed you a list of web pages, maybe five or 10 of them, and I wanted to know which ones do not contain the phrase free software, maybe to focus my activism on. So you don't need to, you don't need to read that slide, but let's say, how would we do this as a normal user? Well, we would probably, in our mail client, maybe open multiple tabs by you know, clicking on this little icon. We'd navigate to the URL and then you know, open all of them. And then for each one, we'd have to go, we'd have to click on find in this page, we'd have to type free software. Let's assume it wasn't found. You know, Click up here a couple times, right click, copy, go over to our editor, right click, paste, then editor to go to a new line, back over here, close the tab, and repeat. Now this doesn't really feel like we're melding mind and machine. We could use control F, like I suggested, but that only saves us a couple of clicks. So can we do better? If instead we opened the tab with control T and pasted the URLs in, used our little uh, use the trick for control F, search for free software. Let's pretend that it didn't actually find anything. We hit control L, control C to copy, alt tab to go over to our editor, control V, enter, alt tab, and then control W would close the tab. This feels a little bit more efficient. You can get into quite the flow with this. And interestingly, we also 
didn't have to touch the mouse. We didn't have to seek out those GUI elements each time. They were literally under our fingertips the entire time. Another interesting aspect of this is, in this case, um, I took a screenshot of IceCat. This is a browser, and there are other different browsers available. Um, this text editor is Pluma. You can swap out these programs, and in, for most GUI equivalents, the key bindings will work exactly the same. If you work on different operating systems, right? every time I give that focus, it, uh, it goes to the next slide. If you work on different operating systems, like Windows, I don't recommend it, but if you do, the key bindings would be exactly the same. Now, if we took that previous slide and kind of condense it a little bit, we get this, which looks a little bit more like instructions from the machine. That bracketed part is the conditional portion. And if you're familiar with macros, then it's kind of like that, the ability to replay, uh, to record and replay keystrokes. So could we do that in this case? Could we automate this process by recording and playing back these uh, shortcuts? And unfortunately not, because it requires a visual inspection upon searching uh, in order to know whether or not to uh, do that conditional logic. It's also tedious and manual. So it works okay with five or 10 URLs, but what if I send you 100 or 1,000? I would not wish that suffering upon anyone. So what if I told you, if I were given this task, I could go grab a coffee, play with the kids, come back in a little while, and have a list generated for me in an automated manner. And it would only take me a minute or two to create that process, and that I don't even think you need to be a programmer in order to create it. Now, for those of you who do know how to do this, you know, this, is where, this is where the concept of wizardry comes in. Um, and some of you might be you know, rolling your eyes thinking, oh, this guy thinks he's so sweet, because the answer is obvious to you. But for users who are thinking in terms of what I just described, the answer is not going to be obvious. And that's because there's this entire world and way of computing that's hidden from us, and it's not hidden from most users, rather. And that's not because it's a secret. It's because these interfaces have de been developed to either mask or replace them by providing interfaces that are good enough for a particular <coughs> use. The problem is good enough is only good enough until it's not, until we start to deviate away from those preconceived workflows. So let's start by lifting the curtain a little bit on a web page. If you right-click on the page and click on View Source, you get a new tab, which is this. And this is sort of like the source code of the web page, or at least most of it. And when we're in here, we can hit Control F all the same, still search for a free software, and it would still be in there. So even though we've gotten rid of the extra visual stuff, we're still able to get at the substance of the page. So clearly, that, that extra stuff wasn't providing us much benefit. And this simple fact that it's plain text opens up a whole new world to us. We stripped away all of the extra GUI stuff, and we're left with the substance of the page. But we're still in a browser in order to get that HTML page. And you know, we don't have to be, though. So if we were to copy, I'm not going to do it here. If we were to copy that, you know, Control-A to select everything, Control-C, Alt-Tab, Control-V, paste it in our editor, we could search in our editor all the same. We're not locked into the web browser for this. Text is a universal interface, and what I mean by that is we don't need specialized tools to work with it. So you can view it in your browser, you can view it in your text editor, you can text it to your friends, you can print it in a book, you can write it out on paper and type it back into your computer. It works all the same. So if we took what we had in our editor, if we pasted the HTML in, saved it as speakers.html, let's say, and double-clicked on it, it would open in our web browser in the same format we were looking at before, but if we open that same file in our text editor, we get the HTML again. It's just these two programs choose to render it in a different way. So we still haven't eliminated the web browser because we need to use it to access the HTML. But if all we're doing is trying to get the HTML for a particular page, it doesn't seem like a very efficient way to do it because we need to open the browser, navigate to the web page, view the source, et cetera. Um, so we're gonna switch our interface a little bit. Uh, up until now, the keyboard's been an alternative to something. So we're gonna go into a world where it is the primary interface. So if you open something called a virtual, virtual terminal emulator, or VTE, you're greeted with this curious string of characters uh, called the command prompt. And the thing that's prompting you for a command is called the shell. And GNU shell is bash. Now, since this is a talk about freedoms, hopefully you're using bash on a operating system that respects your freedom to use, study, share, modify your software. Um, with that said, there are other operating systems where bash is available, like OS X, bash is a default, but again, you lose your freedom there. And Windows, in particular, has this um, kind of misnomer where they call it Bash on Ubuntu on Windows, which is just GNU and Linux running atop of the proprietary Windows kernel. You can do a lot better. For this talk, 
Uh, as is conventional, I'm going to show the command that's being run, prefix with the dollar sign, and then all of the output will follow after. So, retrieving the HTML from a web page. Most GNU and Linux distributions come with GNU wget, and we can use it simply by typing wget, a space, and then the URL that we wish to retrieve. And it's going to have a lot of output. It's not particularly important as long as it succeeds. But you'll notice it says it saves as index.html, which isn't really obvious unless you know a little bit about the web as to why it chose that name. So we can change its behavior and tell it to output to speakers.html with this O flag, which stands for output file. And then that backslash at the end of the line there just allows us to continue on to the next line um, since a new line would normally execute the command. So with this, we've eliminated the web browser. That gives us the raw HTML in speakers.html. If we were to open that file and compare it to the one that we saved using our editor manually, they would be exactly the same. So you know, this, I know that the command line can be a little cryptic to some people, but if we compare this to what we might do in a web browser normally, which is you know, hit control L to go to the URL bar and type in the URL, it's really not all that different. We're replacing control L, W, get, I mean, you'd still have to view the source of the HTML and such, but it's really not too bad. But now we're left with searching. So again, we used our text editor previously to search for free software. Can we replace that portion of it? And there's a tool called grep. So for grep, you invoke similarly to wget. You just do grep space. The first argument is what we're searching for. It's quoted because it contains a space. And then the file that we're searching. So that will search for free software in speakers.html. And it will output a bunch of different texts. I've only included a snippet here. But it gives us the results all the same. So with that, we've replicated control F. And did we convey our thoughts concisely to the machine? I think that's pretty concise. But the reply we received is kind of information overload, because we don't care for a research task whether or not, you know, we don't care to see the matches. We just care whether or not matches did occur. So we're going to modify the behavior slightly and use this quiet flag. And grep is going to change its behavior so that rather than outputting, it's going to change its exit status, which is um, a response to the shell for whether or not it succeeded. And the shell has a way to say, execute this next command if the previous succeeded by putting two ampersands between the two commands. So this is saying, search for free software in speakers.html and echo yes if it's found. Since echo is its own command that can stand on its own, you can also uh, run it on its own. So this is the typical hello world program in shell. But if you remember the research task, it's to find the web pages that do not have uh, that match. So if instead we use two pipes instead of two ampersands, that X is an OR, and we'll echo if no match was found. Now, we're still not quite rid of our editor yet because we still needed to write the files. So writing to a file is such a common operation that the shell has a built-in operator for it. So it normally commands write to something called standard out, which is what you observe uh, on the screen when you run the command. Output redirection. Uh, writes it somewhere else. So if we do a single uh, greater than sign, we can output to hello.txt, and it will overwrite, in the case of the first example, what was there previously. So hello.txt would only contain hello again world. If you do two ampersands, it'll append. And so the second one, results.txt, will contain two lines, first line and second line, respectively. And if the file doesn't exist, it'll create it for you. So looking at this command for a second, does anyone want to guess what the output would be? or the result of this command might be. <coughs> Sorry, putting you on the spot. So uh, bringing all of this together, uh, I may feel kind of cheated. The result of this is nothing. So we know that speakers contains the term free software. So this is going to retrieve the URL, do grep quiet to search for it, and then it's not going to echo anything because it will have found a match. In fact, results.txt won't even exist if it didn't exist before. But this is a pretty hefty command I have to modify any time we want to search for a URL. So we're going to introduce something called a variable. We're going to take that URL and assign it to a variable called URL. And then anywhere we had that URL previously, we're going to reference it by prefixing it with a dollar sign. And I also put it in quotes just in case there's special characters or uh, spaces. And to make it a little more concise, we're also going to use instead of dash dash quiet, uh, dash q. And then in the case of wget, you can make it even more concise by mushing the arguments together. You don't have to do it that way. But we're still left with this speakers.html, which is this temporary file that's really just polluting our file system just for the sake of giving it to grep. So can we get rid of that? Now I'll introduce a new notation, and then I'll, ex I'll explain it over a bit. So first, 
Normally, commands write to standard out by default. Wget is an exception. It writes to a file by default. So if we replace speakers.html with a dash, that's a convention for most command line programs that says write to standard out. In the case of grep, if we simply omit speakers.html, it reads from standard in by default. And then that pipe at the beginning of the line for grep says connect the standard output of wget to the standard input of grep. So now instead of reading through a file, it's passing through a pipeline. And I'll get into that a little more in a little bit. But if we make it more concise, we get this line. So, oh, and you know, if, if we find that, you know, if you find that that command's getting a little too cryptic, you can also alias command. So we alias wget as fetch URL, and then we don't have to worry about what exactly it's doing anymore. And if you prefix wget with Torify, by the way, if you have Tor installed, then you can download all this stuff through Tor. So this is what we started with, and this is what we ended with. This is much more concise. We can clearly see from this that we're, the URL is that speaker's URL, we're fetching it, we're searching for free software, and then if it is not found, we're outputting, or appending rather, the URL to results.txt. And again, we're able to do this because text is a universal interface. So we started by inspecting text manually at each part of this process. And at each part, we started replacing the human component with a command. Because text has kind of put my, uh, man and machine on similar footing now. So we also introduced a pipe. So we've kind of changed from working with an interactive GUI toward a keyboard interface, and now we're doing another fundamental shift in that we're starting that, that ability to pass text through a pipeline is a fundamental principle uh, of these Unix commands that I started introducing to you. So Doug McElroy is credited for the Unix pipe, and he, as part of the Unix philosophy, described it as expect the output of every program to become the input to another. And we can summarize the Unix philosophy as write programs that do one thing and do it well, write programs that work together, write programs that handle text streams because that is a universal interface. So this represents another profound shift in the way we're thinking because now we're learning to take problems and start to decompose them into small operations that exist as part of a larger pipeline. So we're able to chain small specialized programs together uh, and transform the text at each step to make it more suitable for the next. So, now we're going to get into a more sophisticated example of a pipeline. So if we take that speakers page uh, from before, if we look at the HTML, which I'm not, I'm not going to pull it up here, but each section, each speaker header uh, can be denoted by this speaker dash header. So A5 just tells grep to output the line followed by the, followed by the five lines that follow it. And head N14 just says, as part of that pipeline, only output the first 14 lines. And you'll notice that the titles um, are enclosed in M tags. So let's pass that to grep instead of head, which gives us all of the titles. Oh, I suppose I should provide the context. The speaker list, um, I noticed that multiple speakers had, a, uh, had multiple talks. So I want to know specifically what, um, what talks had the most speakers associated with them. Sorry, important context there. So that's the goal. Um, but you'll notice that Tor project line has an and in it. So there's a speaker, uh, a couple of them actually, that presented in multiple talks. So grep fortunately has this O flag, which stands for only. And that says only output the portion of the line that matches the pattern rather than the entire line. And if there happen to be multiple matches on a single line, grep will up output them on separate lines, which is exactly what we want. Now, this cryptic looking pattern is called a regular expression. I don't expect you to learn it for this talk. We had to make sure it only matched on the um, surrounding M tags. Uh, so don't worry about understanding that for now. That just says match any non-less than character between M tags. So that gives us the list of all the talks. We want the count of the talks. So if we pass it to unique, C in unique says count them, and D count the duplicates, and D says only output the duplicates. And unique relies on the output being sorted because it only looks at consecutive lines. So first, we pipe it to sort. And then we finally sort it numerically in reverse one last time because we want the top talks. And we take the top five of them by piping it to head. And that gives us our answer. So through this simple pipe, you know, I, again, you know, in the eye of the beholder, um, fairly simple pipeline, we have found out the talks with the top, uh, the, with the most speakers in them. Now, just because I, to show you that it's possible, 
again, this is a more complicated rate of expression, and I don't expect you to learn it. SED stands for stream editor. And what we're doing is we're reformatting this into an English sentence by taking those parenthesized groups in the beginning. So remember, we had the number first. And then taking the text between M and reformatting it as an English sentence. And now if you happen to have the program installed and you pipe this to eSpeak, your computer will speak that text to you. So because, you know, listening to computer talk is all the rage now today. So. And what's interesting about this, too, is that how I presented it to you is exactly how I developed it. So in programming, we call these types of interactive environments REPLs, read, eval, print, loop. So the shell reads the command, it evaluates it, prints the result, and then keeps prompting you for commands. And you know, as a hacker, this is really useful for me because I can rapidly prototype something. And I can worry about cleaning it up later or maybe writing it in a different language. But users aren't experts at these commands. They need to go through a discovery process. And a shell is really good for that process because you can just type commands. And remember, we, since text is a universal interface, a human can replace a command at any point in the pipeline. So users can just keep layering commands and trying to play with it and figure out uh, something that works for them. It doesn't have to be pretty. It just has to work. So. Up to this point, if we go back to our research task, we've come up with a list of URLs um, that don't contain free software, but how do we feed those URLs into the pipeline? We have a few different options. The simple one is what if you just, assuming you're using a GUI email client, save the email to a file, and then using grep, and again, a regular expression, we can pull the uh, URLs right out of the email. Now, this isn't perfect, like it'll grab a punctuation, for example, at the end of the URL, but we're assuming a list of URLs here. So here's a few examples. And we're going to introduce while and read. So while will continue, to, it will execute its body, that echo there, as long as its command, read, exits successfully. And read will continue, in this case, to read the URLs from standard in, um, from email of links.txt, until uh, there are no more lines to read. So if we put our pipeline into that, like this, and the only change I made is moving results.txt uh, outside of the loop, um, this will iterate through everything and uh, execute that command for each URL that it finds. But with this, we can't see the text unless we actually open up the file. So for convenience, we can use T, which is named for a pipe T, in that it continues to pass the data through the pipeline to standard out, and it also outputs it to whatever file you provide. But if all we're doing is taking this and pasting it into a GUI email client, wouldn't it be convenient if it were already on the clipboard for us, which we can do with XClip? Um, but again, we can't see the output. So if we use this special notation with bash, um, that spawns xclip within a subshell and then replaces that with a path to a virtual file representing standard in of xclip. So that has the effect of t writing to xclip and still passing the data through the pipeline to standard out. If we're writing to the clipboard, though, why bother saving the email to a file to begin with? Why don't we just read it from the clipboard? So if you copy the email to the clipboard, we can pull it right out and you know, pass it to grep at that point. Or you could eliminate grep entirely if you just copied the, uh, the list of URLs instead. So we can also, you know, what if, uh, what if you did all this processing and then as an afterthought, you're like, OK, I want this on the clipboard. We use the greater than sign to redirect output, but we can also use a less than sign to redirect input. So we can redirect results.txt into xclip as standard in, in place of standard in. All right. So again, I mentioned I could go grab a coffee and play with my kids. That would now would be the time, now that we've automated away this process. But the thing is, if we can go grab a coffee, that kind of implies that this pipeline is a bottleneck. The internet's fast nowadays. We shouldn't have to wait. So what can we do better? The shell has, or at least POSIX compliant shells, uh, of which Bash is one, has a way to execute commands, put them in the background, uh, and continue executing other things. So in this case, that single ampersand, I know it can be confusing with the double and single, um, will put that sleep one and echo into the background, immediately echo start, and then one second later, will echo done. So if we just append an ampersand right in the body of our loop there, then it'll execute. If we have five of them, it'll do all five at once. If we have 10 of them, it'll do all 10 at once. But the problem is, if we have 100 of them, it'll do 100 of them at once. If we have 1,000, it'll do 1,000. And that's not a very efficient use of resources, spawning thousands of processes to uh, you know, do this task. 
and you're also kind of dosing the websites when you do it, so you, network administrators aren't going to be too happy. So in order to proceed, we're going to have to, up until this point, our commands have been like part of this interactive shell. We need to make it so that external programs can also access them. And one of the other nice things about shell is after you're done tinkering, you can pretty much just copy and paste exactly what you had on the command line, put it in a file, and it will, with some minor exceptions, it'll continue to work as is. Of course, the one minor exception we have are aliases by default only work in interactive sessions. You could create a function, but I just decided to throw wget in there. And then those positional parameters one and two just represent these two arguments here that we're passing to URL grep. So we name the command URL grep and can invoke it like this. And then this thing at the top here is called the shebang, and it just tells the kernel uh, what interpreter to use to execute this script. And then this chmod sets the executable bits, makes it uh, executable so you can do it like so, and this is equivalent to what we were doing previously. Now we're going to replace that while loop with xargs, which constructs command lines. So from standard input, it's going to read a list of URLs, and then it's going to append them to the end of this portion here. If we, this n1 says read one at a time and then execute it for each single one that's read, because otherwise it would take all of them and append it uh, to a single command line, which, which isn't quite what we want. So now, uh, xargs has a p flag, which tells it how many processes to run. So if we say p5, we can tell it run five concurrent processes. So at this point, uh, how long would this take to run? So I came up with a list of URLs uh, to FSF, Wikipedia, and I forget what else, and I just repeated it, so we had 1,000 of them. This WCL counts the number of lines. WC stands for word count, L for lines, in the file and time outputs time information. So if I run 10 concurrent processes on my computer at home, 1,000 URLs finished within 18 seconds. So when I said it'd take me a couple minutes to write the command, you can imagine if you're, you know, once you get used to this, you write the command and execute it in the amount of time it takes users to open a handful of tabs using the manual GUI way we had before. So I think that you know, the, again, it'll, it takes a little getting used to, but I think that you know, normal users can learn to use this process. So again, we shifted away from what uh, the, user, the developers intended with the web browser, and we have automated away this task completely. Users don't need to rely on developers in order to do this. So now that we've taken care of the research task, um, I do have a few more examples that we can run through. Um, some of them I'll go through a little more quickly, so make sure I uh, leave time for questions. Uh, how much time do we have? Ten? All right. So one common operation is, you know, people take a lot of pictures nowadays, especially since people have smartphones. And Image Magic is a suite of tools that is able to do operations on images that you would expect to only be able to do in, say, the GIMP or other, uh, uh, other image processing uh, GUIs. I'm doing the simplest possible operation here, which is just resize an image by 50%. But if you had, this is called globbing. If you had a bunch of PNG files in one directory, then for each of them, it would run this command uh, and resize them, creating a new file prefixed with SM. And then this command, I'm not going to go over this in too much detail, um, would execute uh, in recursive directories. So if you had your library of photos, like I know I and my wife have, can run this one command and resize thousands of them in one go. Again, we go back to the concept of scaling. This scales trivially, you know, rather than opening each one individually in GIMP and resizing them. So I mentioned I focus on user privacy and security. I can't possibly do a talk without putting something related to that in it. So we're going to use some standard Unix tools to do some password generation. So in this case, TR stands for translate. And what we're going to do is read from dev u random, which is a stream of random uh, binary data. And we're going to say C means the complement, and D means delete. So we're going to say anything that's not a graph, and a graph is a printable non-space character, delete. So if we take the first, so previously we used head for lines, now we're using it for characters. If we take the first, first 32 of such characters, then we get a randomly generated password. Now, that's great if you have a password manager, but if you need something actually memorable, then maybe you want to use something like Diceware or EFF's uh, large word list. And we could use wget here to copy it. The reason I didn't is because if you're going to do something this sensitive, I suggest you 
inspect it rather than just blindly downloading something and throw it into a pipeline. So it has two columns delimited by tabs um, because you're normally supposed to use dice, roll the dice. The first column has numbers in it to associate it with the dice you rolled. But we don't need dice if you know we, we have tools that can do it for us. So we take the second column, which is only the word list, we pipe it to sort and tell it to permute it randomly using w random like we did up here. And then EFF recommends using at least six words. So we take the first six of them. And then since they're on new lines, we use TR, again, like we did up here, but this time translate new lines to spaces. And I'm kind of upset that I didn't keep this password to myself, because this passphrase rather, because this one's pretty memorable and morbid sounding. But. All right, now speaking of password managers, Again, to try to demonstrate the types of things that you can do when you can just compose programs together, uh, GNU PG is a uh, program that can do you know, various types of uh, cryptography. And let's say you had a GPG encrypted file. This is how you would decrypt that file. So just to show you the structure of it, I said decrypt it and show us the first three lines. So let's say we had a password database containing the URL, username, and password in this format. And let's say we wanted to create a simple password manager. So we decrypt the file and we pass it to grep and say return the two lines following the match. So maybe here you would want to um, bind a key to your window manager and maybe like highlight a URL in your URL bar, hit the key in your window manager, and then maybe you, know, you, could, pa you could pull uh, the URL from the clipboard. I didn't do that in this example, but that's one possible option. So we grep for the URL, we return the last two lines with tail instead of head, which gives us user and pass. And then here we show read, before it only had one variable, now we show it with two. So key will end up being the first word, and then value will be everything that follows after that. And then we'll prompt the user to paste the key. Uh, I'm sorry, key being the uh, user or pass. And we don't use echo here for certain technical reasons that I'll kind of leave as an exercise to you as to why it doesn't work. So instead we're using printf. Just know that in this case it acts as echo does. And we're outputting it, we're piping it to xclip like we did previously with the email example. But we're adding two extra options here. L stands for loop and quiet keeps it in the foreground rather than, um, rather than working it in the background. And what this does is allows you to paste it only a single time. So this has a couple benefits. Uh, first of all, what if we had malware on our computer that was monitoring the clipboard uh, and pulling passwords out of it, which is not uncommon. L1 causes XClip to terminate as soon as it pastes. So if we saw our little password manager move on to requesting to paste the next one or repeating, or if you went to paste and saw it pasted the wrong thing, then you would know, crap, you know, something happened, I better change my passwords. It also has a nice effect that you can go in your web browser, hit Control V for the user, tab, hit Control V again, and it'll paste the password. You don't need to copy two separate values. So it has a convenience factor as well. But that's not good enough for me. Uh, if we took that command and we called it, say, get password, and I put that on my home computer, I don't want to have to carry around my passwords with me. You've got to deal with issues like how do you keep passwords in sync? Um, and then, you know, some people might be worried about if you're traveling, what if, you know, say TSA asked me to decrypt my laptop or something, now I've got to change all my passwords. You don't have to worry about it if it's on a remote system. So it requires a little bit of configuration, which I'm not going to get into here, but there are ways to have GNU PG forwarded over SSH uh, so that it's accessible to a remote system. And why here? Uh, forwards the X11 session. X11 is that graphical environment. So that gives the remote system access to my clipboard, which could be dangerous, but again, this is my home system that I trust. So it can write to the clipboard. So again, get password is that command we saw on the previous slide, and we're gonna, we gave it an argument. In this case, uh, you know, the argu maybe we replace this with dollar sign one. And that would for, I should take this out of my pocket earlier. Uh, I carry a nitro, my Nitro key around with me, which is a smart card. And this allows me to do two-factor authentication. So if I, my password database is encrypted with a key that is on here, so over SSH, it'll connect to my GNU PG agent running on my laptop. It'll prompt me for the password, for the PIN. So that's something I know. The PIN is something I have, the smart card. Uh, and that gives us two-factor authentication for free. So if somebody's looking over my shoulder at the password, then, you know, unless they punch me out and take my key too, then at least my password database is safe. 
Uh, another uh, example that I'm going to go through quickly here is taking screenshots. So I mentioned, Im uh, I showed uh, Image Magic before. It comes with a suite of tools. One was convert, another one is import. And import takes screenshots. So if you just type, um, eh, uh, I'll get to it in a minute. If you just type import and then a file name, it allows you to draw a region of a screen and take a screenshot of that region. If you just click on a window, it takes a screenshot of that window. This one in particular I find interesting because remember this dash from before, which we use with wget, which is a convention saying write to standard out. So this tells import to allow you to select an area of screen and then pipes it to standard out rather than writing it to a file. So previously we're, we were piping text, now we're piping binary data. And we pipe it to xclip in this special um, type which says image PNG. So now you have an image on your clipboard that you can then paste in your web browser or paste in a, a program like GIMP that recognizes images. But I wanted to come up with something a little more interesting that again shows the how you can, again, string commands together so easily and, and interesting and you know, ways that seem somewhat innovative to users or novel. So in this case, we import a screenshot with import, and I'm gonna try to demonstrate this, and we're using Tesseract. And Kause is just because I feel like screwing around and the cow's cute. So Tesseract is an OCR program. And if I can, I tried it at home on this keynote speakers list. I'm just gonna view it uh, in the browser like this so it stops moving on me. And now your mileage may vary with Tesseract because it depends on your training set. But this is using Trisquil and I tried Trisquil at home. So if we run this command line, uh, if I type it correctly, yes. These two dashes, the first argument means read from standard in, the second one means write to standard out. And I don't have Kause here so we're just gonna omit it. Um, the FSF was nice enough to install these two programs for me. If we highlight Actually, hold on, I, and now it's, let, let me move this down a little bit and try it again so it's a little more impressive. So this is import, we're highlighting the region, and we get Tesseract to, uh, it worked much better at home. It worked perfectly at home, actually, which you could see on the side. But you can, you know, you can see a little bit here. It grabbed keynote speakers and stuff, and again, it depends slightly on your training data and the page segmentation mode that, that you choose. Um, but you know, the same, I like this example because it's one of the easiest ones we've done, yet it seems somewhat novel. I mean, you have a program where you can select an area of the screen and run OCR on it. And you could do other things with that. You could pipe it to eSpeak if you wanted it to speak to you. You can imagine maybe binding a key to your window manager um, so you could highlight a region and, and have it speak to you. Um, if you don't want that, there's a program called Zenity you could pipe to that sh shows a dialog um, and can show the text in it. So again, I, I just want to show that if you know that if you start to explore and learn this core set of programs, you can just put them together in different ways to create entirely new systems that again, developers don't have to get involved in. I don't doubt that anyone in this room could learn to write something like that as long as you knew the conventions and the programs that exist. So I wanna finish with one final example that is definitely not melding mind to machine here, but I mentioned earlier when we were talking about macros, could we automate this away? And I said no, because there's this visual element to it. But now we have Tesseract. So to kind of bring this full circle, xdo tool is like a Swiss army knife for x11. It allows you to send commands, move the mouse, uh, send keystrokes, resize windows, do all sorts of stuff. So what we're saying is select a window that ends in GNU IceCat and sync just stops it, you know, make sure that operation completes before we uh, continue. And then I resize the window just to make sure that when I take a screenshot down here, I know where, where things are gonna go. And then we proceed to do what we did manually with the key bindings earlier, which is send control T. We read our URL list. We send control L, type in the URL, hit return. Uh, the reason I need kind of separate ones here is because you can't chain them after key. It's just a detail of XDo tool. And <clears throat> we insert some sleeps here to give it time. I use Tor at home, so I need a little bit of extra time uh, for the command to complete. We type we hit control F, type free software. And then the interesting part now to get around that whole visual inspection is we run import, which again is image magic. We say use, you can give it an X11 ID for the window and we use XDo tool to get the active window. And then we crop it to the region where on my system at home, the matches are. So, and by matches I mean the, this thing right here. So if you type something, that doesn't exist, it'll say phrase not found. Um, 
so that's what we search for. We run test raft, and as long as it works correctly, we grep for something that begins with phrase. And if it's found, that means the URL was not found, so we echo it. So this is the equivalent of the other command line script we did previously. Uh, I don't recommend doing that. It was just an absurd example. I, again, used to show that, you know, the th types of things you can do on the command line. But, um, so I'm gonna, just gonna kind of leave this slide up. I mean, I can't, you know, you're, you're gonna have to figure out how to do, work your way around the command line. I know GUIs are intended to be kind of, you're, they're built in a way that you kind of can discover things for yourself. You don't have to read documentation. Command line, it's a little bit different. So GNU comes with, <clears throat> all GNU packages come with info manuals, which are like books. Uh, all GNU programs have a help command, which out, outputs usage information. And um, so, and then there's man pages that exist for most Unix commands. Um, so at that point, at uh, this point, I'll open it up for questions. Uh, if there aren't any, I can ramble on on more things, but I think we only have about five minutes, four minutes or so left. Um, If you have questions, please uh, queue up here, preferably, or we can bring a microphone to you. We have a winner. So uh, aside from like the built-in help, there's a lot of stuff that you kind of need to know to do this. What do you recommend as a reference? Are there any really good free references that kind of, because I was in, you know, the XClip stuff. What is that package in particular? Because I'd never seen some of that stuff. So there's still some cool stuff and it's examples, but the great thing about a GUI is that, you, you know, for people that don't have perfect memories, you know, it's easy to remind you, but then you have to practice something. So as a user, it's like, you know, it takes a lot of practice to get that memory. And even as someone who's written and knows a little bit about regular, regular expressions, a lot of times I'll just Google somebody else who's written the script and then I'll find it. So is there like a good reference where people have put together like a grimoire or whatever going with the wizardry thing of all these different scripts so you can build off of them or whatever? I don't know, just for people that want to learn how to do this stuff but aren't experts in the command line in the first place. Sure, uh, you brought up a few good points there. As far as a single resource, I can't necessarily say so. I know if you're starting, and again, don't mind reading, Bash's man page is awesome. I printed it out and read it like a book. Um, there's Greg's Wiki, uh, is what it's called, from, named after the author. Uh, he goes over a lot of the pitfalls of Shell, because um, there are a lot of them. As far as like discovering commands, Xclip happens to come installed with X11. It's um, a called Xcel, which is a little easier to work with, but I didn't mention it here because it wasn't installed by default. Um, as you mentioned, discovering these commands can be a little difficult. I mean, there is, I guess, no substitute for searching online. Um, as far as one like unified resource, I don't really have a strong recommendation. The core like Unix utilities are part of uh, GNU Core Utils. Uh, so if you look at the info page for Core Utils, that goes over all of the kind of core commands that you really ought to know if you're doing any serious work on the command line. Um, I, I even forget some from time to time. But as far as getting into something like XClip, really, I mean, to be honest, those are the types of things where I just, you know, I was searching on, oh, how do I solve this problem? And I happened to find it. I'm sure it is documented somewhere. Um, but especially when you're starting to get into the world of GUIs, like if you want to start playing music from the command line or manipulating images or all these other things, um, it becomes more kind of less in the space of the traditional hackers where there's documentation on the command line and you're getting more into, you know, you're gonna have to look toward web resources. So I wish I could give you a really solid answer. Um, if you have a person who knows the command line, that, that's your best route. But. Can we do a flashback question? Sure. Oh, sure. Just for a quick plug, uh, if you go to the shop, the GNU shop for the uh, GNU Press, mm. we have the introduction to the command line. It's a $20 book that has a very good introduction. Sorry. I haven't actually read it. But I, I also it. wanted to plug a book that helped me a lot in learning this stuff, sure. which is an O'Reilly book called the, uh, the Bash Cookbook. And it has okay. a ton of things. It's like little short scripts of how do you do some kind of useful thing. And there's like hundreds of them. So that's like one resource. Obviously, it doesn't cover everything, but it covers like hundreds of things. Sure. 
Great, thank you. Hi. Um, just had a quick comment. Are you aware of the 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 pains associated with parsing HTML using regex? Yes, I am. So the example I used was kind of a segue from the browser. Um, yeah. So scraping is what it's called. I don't, you know, necessarily recommend doing it that way. I wanted to stick to the core utilities. Are you about to recommend a, a XML parser? No, I actually wondered if you had a good suggestion for something to use in the command line because I've been looking and it's like I can pipe out to like Perl or whatever, but that's not. Yeah, it's not right. easy. So usually I end up using, so grep has a dash capital P flag, allows you to use Perl regular expressions, which are a bit easier to work with. To be honest, I usually do that. I do some scraping professionally too, as a web developer. So I mean, I mean like using a HTML parsing peg, because the reg, it's like, what is it? It's a context-free grammar, HTML is, but regex isn't, so yeah, it's like trying to parse C with regex. Sorry, that's technical. Yeah, I mean part of the complexity with HTML is too, it's not actually, you can't necessarily use XML tools because yeah. it's not valid XML all the time. Did you have a suggestion for? Uh, you can use XPath. Uh, XPath should be perfectly capable of parsing uh, HTML. Even if it's not valid XML, XPath will still work? Uh, in practice, yes. Uh, most implementations of XPath uh, have been designed to overcom okay. overcome common issues. Okay, I have used XPath, I didn't realize it worked with HTML though. Most uh, it sites, depends on the implementation, yep. again. Most, yeah. you know, I, web developers usually want to write valid XML for their HTML, but it doesn't always work out that way, so. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's all I just wanted to, I just wanted to answer the regex thing. Okay. okay, and we've reached the end of the session, so another round of applause for Mike. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you.